Intel just lost $100 billion in 48 hours. Not because of a crash, but because Beijing flipped a switch. Overnight, the king of chips became the most vulnerable pawn in the global tech war. From a single decision in Beijing, made quietly, but engineered to hit Silicon Valley at its core. One move, and it's threatening to unwind America's entire chip empire. On April 12, 2025, China's Ministry of Industry and Information Technology quietly issued a policy change that caused Intel to hemorrhage over $100 billion in market cap in less than 48 hours. The directive banned government agencies and major state-backed firms from purchasing chips made by U.S. manufacturers, including Intel, AMD, and Micron, citing digital sovereignty and supply chain risk according to a report in the South China Morning Post. Within hours, procurement systems were rewritten. By the following morning, key contracts with China Mobile, State Grid, and Huawei-linked server vendors had been nullified. Intel, which derived nearly 27% of its 2024 revenue, roughly $22 billion from China alone, saw its stock plunge 18.3% by close of trading on April 14th, as confirmed by Bloomberg Markets. Traders weren't just reacting to lost sales. They were pricing in the beginning of a complete Chinese phase-out of U.S. semiconductor supply. But what if this wasn't just about semiconductors at all? What if the target was bigger, U.S. innovation itself? Beijing's move may appear defensive on the surface, but the structure suggests an offensive strategy with surgical precision. According to geopolitical analyst Emily Jin at the Center for a New American Security, CNS. This isn't decoupling, it's deliberate erosion. Intel's dependency on Chinese customers made it a uniquely vulnerable target. In contrast, firms like NVIDIA generate only 19% of their revenue from China and have diversified AI partnerships globally. Intel, however, relies heavily on sales of PC and server processors tied to enterprise and telecom firms still deeply integrated with Chinese infrastructure. By pulling that thread, China didn't just punish Intel, it created internal disruption inside America's most essential tech corridors. The collapse in Intel's valuation also dragged down ETFs like SOXX and SMH, triggering a 4.2% dip in the PHLX Semiconductor Index that same day, according to the Wall Street Journal. The ripple was broad, but Intel bore the brunt because it was still too attached. And that vulnerability? It only gets sharper when you zoom out. Intel's decline wasn't sudden. It was the result of compounding execution failures layered atop structural risk. In 2011, Intel held 80% of the global PC processor market. By the fourth quarter of 2024, that figure dropped to just 57%, according to IDC. A series of botched node transitions, including years-long delays in their 10 nanometer and 7 nanometer rollouts, allowed AMD to claw back serious market share while Apple and Amazon began designing custom chips. Then came the financial underperformance. Intel posted a $2.8 billion quarterly net loss in the first quarter of 2023 and laid off over 1,200 employees in the fourth quarter of 2024. By the time China pulled the plug in 2025, Intel had lost its pricing power, its dominance, and its strategic insulation. As semiconductor policy researcher Doug O'Neill of RAND notes, Intel's business model still relies on yesterday's globalization. And Beijing just closed that window. But could this move also be about something else? Something that China's been quietly building? Because there's a looming deadline that makes this policy shift look less like a reaction and more like the start of a clock. According to internal planning documents reviewed by Reuters, the Chinese government aims to eliminate all U.S.-sourced semiconductors from public infrastructure, energy systems, and telecom equipment by December 2027. The directive, dubbed Clean Silicon, mandates that by the first quarter of 2026, 80% of all central government computing systems must run on domestically designed chips. For Intel and its peers, this isn't just a loss of market access. It's the forced obsolescence of their products inside the world's second largest tech market. Morgan Stanley now projects that this policy could strip $350 billion in cumulative revenue from U.S. chip makers by the end of 2027. Analysts at J.P. Morgan note that, while immediate losses are painful, the long-term damage is strategic.
If China succeeds, it proves that the global chip supply chain can survive, perhaps thrive, without U.S. tech. That sets a precedent for countries like Brazil, Indonesia, and even parts of Europe. What Beijing is executing isn't a ban. It's a proof of concept for a post-American tech stack. But for a self-sufficient stack to work, you need cutting-edge chips. And that brings us to the biggest surprise yet. In September 2024, teardown firm Tech Insight stunned the global tech community when it revealed that Huawei's Mate 70 Pro smartphone contained a 5 nanometer Kirin chip. Produced domestically by SMIC, the chip was built using older DUV lithography machines, but employed multi-patterning techniques previously thought too inefficient for sub-7 nanometer production without EUV. The news contradicted U.S. assumptions that without ASML's EUV tools, China couldn't advance beyond 14 nanometers. Intel, meanwhile, was still resolving yield issues in its Ohio fab and had yet to mass-produce its 18A node. Huawei's chip wasn't just symbolic. It worked and sold. In just six months, Huawei shipped over 45 million Mate 70 devices, according to Canalis, demonstrating domestic demand and supply chain maturity. S-Mike's revenue surged 47% year-over-year in the first quarter of 2025, driven largely by state-aligned procurement, while Intel's data center revenue dropped 22% in the same quarter, per Intel's latest earnings call. The U.S. bet on bottlenecking China's tools, says John Bateman, a technology policy fellow at Carnegie. But China bet on scaling what they already had and won. Now, with Huawei's chip ecosystem functioning independently, the barrier to fully replacing Intel inside China isn't technical. It's time. Let's stop here. Because this wasn't supposed to happen. Not like this. The U.S. had the tools, the patents, the global suppliers. But somehow, Huawei just leapfrogged the playbook, with none of the pieces Washington thought were essential. And if Huawei can do that with smartphones, what happens when they turn to servers, cloud, and AI chips? What began in 2015 as a bureaucratic roadmap has now evolved into one of the most aggressive industrial transformation efforts on the planet. As of the first quarter of 2025, over 75% of China's strategic sectors, including aerospace, power grids, and telecom, have transitioned at least partially to domestic semiconductor suppliers, according to data from the China Center for Information Industry Development. Huawei, SMIC, Longson, and others are now receiving upwards of $58 billion annually in state support, while U.S. firms like Intel are being systematically excluded from procurement chains. Analyst Nina Xiang, founder of China Money Network, notes that Beijing isn't racing the U.S. anymore. They're building a parallel ecosystem that doesn't need it. The U.S. share of Chinese chip imports fell to 28% in 2024, down from 41% in 2021. While domestic alternatives now capture over 55% of government computing contracts. The question is no longer whether China can replace U.S. firms, but how soon they stop needing them entirely. But can Intel respond before the drawbridge fully rises, or has that window already closed? The Chips and Science Act unlocked $52.7 billion in federal incentives, with Intel positioned as its largest beneficiary slated to receive $8.5 billion in grants and $11 billion in loans, as confirmed by the Commerce Department in March 2025. Yet despite the funding, execution lags. Intel's Ohio Megafab, dubbed Silicon Heartland, is now projected to begin partial operations in late 2026, nearly a year behind schedule, due to zoning delays and construction setbacks, according to a March report by the Wall Street Journal. Meanwhile, Taiwan's TSMC is on track to begin 3 nanometer production at its Arizona facility by Q3, 2025. Intel's $8.2 billion deal with Amazon Web Services announced in February offers a temporary revenue cushion. But analysts at Bernstein warn it may not offset the $13.7 billion in annual revenue Intel risks losing from China by 2027. As Morningstar's Abhinav Davaluri put it, Government support can stabilize Intel, but it can't accelerate Moore's law or buy back lost time. So what does this mean for the American consumer? And who pays if Intel stumbles further? 
the economic blowback won't stay in corporate boardrooms. In 2025 alone, Intel has announced layoffs affecting 1,250 employees across its data center and client computing divisions, primarily in Oregon and California, according to filings with the SEC. Those cuts follow a sharp 19% decline in Q1 client processor shipments, a direct result of slumping demand and lost international orders. Consumers will feel it next. According to leaked pricing roadmaps reviewed by Bloomberg Tech, OEMs including HP and Dell are planning a 12-17% to price hike on upcoming models powered by Intel chips, citing supply volatility and lower volume commitments. Without China to absorb production at scale, Intel must either cut output or raise prices to preserve margins. And that impacts more than laptops, cloud hosting costs, enterprise server hardware, and AI acceleration units used in healthcare and logistics are all being repriced. This isn't an abstract supply chain issue. It's one that's about to show up on your next invoice. But even with public funding and consumer price hikes, can Intel really recover? Or is this just the first stage of a longer decline? Intel's future now hinges on a race between capital and relevance. With over $19 billion in Chips Act support and strategic deals with AWS and the Department of Defense, the scaffolding for a rebound exists. But investors remain skeptical. Intel stock has underperformed the PHLX Semiconductor Index by 31% over the last 12 months. And analysts at Goldman Sachs recently downgraded the stock, citing persistent margin compression, missed execution timelines, and increasing foreign competition. More telling is Intel's shrinking innovation lead. Its 18A node isn't expected to reach mass deployment until mid-2026, while Samsung and TSMC are already in commercial production at 3 nanometers and ramping up 2 nanometer prototypes. Former CEO Pat Gelsinger, now back in a strategic advisory role, warned in a March CNBC interview, It's not about winning one quarter, it's about whether we stay in the game for the next decade. But staying in the game requires more than factories. It requires regaining technological credibility, and Intel hasn't delivered that yet. But if you think Intel is the only target, look again. China's next move hits even closer to home. Intel may be the headline today, but it's not the endgame. China isn't isolating one company. It's redefining who gets to participate in the global tech race. And if you're still clinging to the idea that this is a chip dispute, you're missing the point. Beijing's next step? A full-scale export ban on gallium, rare earths, and AI training chips. Washington's response is coming, but it may already be too late. Because behind the tech war lies a deeper question. Can a country that invented the semiconductor era survive its own dependency on foreign supply chains? We're glad you're enjoying this video. Please like and subscribe. Check out another video that is now on your screen.